Good morning. Welcome to Laurel. God is present and alive this morning. Amen? Let's stand. I'm going to read from 1 Timothy. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. The God that we serve gave his son as a ransom for you. And this morning, his call on your life may be to respond to him in some way. This morning, keep your ears open, keep your hearts open. Let's listen for the call of God on our lives. Let's worship together. This way. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. No be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou dentures today. Um, in his book, The Tells, James Michener talks of the two schools of rabbinical thought in Capernaum that spent two years trying to decide whether it was okay to wear a false tooth on the Sabbath. Uh, some thought it was purely ornamental, therefore should not be done. Others thought it was functional and was therefore allowed. Well, that one didn't win the argument. But while I was thinking about this, our dog, Nimitz, decided that he was of the Solomon's point of view. He snatched it out of my lap and broke it into pieces. And that's the second time he's done that. So, I have decided I am without dentures today. Please try not to let it distract you.
What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please watch me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, creator and author of life and, and all that is good, we humbly ask for your presence this morning, not in return for our goodness, but because of your steadfast love and the, the promises that you've made through your son Jesus. As we look around this morning as we drove in and see the signs of spring all around us and and all the beauty, it reminds us of those promises of renewal in this life and the resurrection to come, those promises you've given us. And we acknowledge our unworthiness before you, but we praise you and thank you for loving us anyway. I pray that our worship this morning will bring encouragement to many of us and all of us, especially those that are struggling this morning with illness, and other, and other battles and challenges in this world. We pray for a special measure of your spirit with them. And I pray that as we lean on you, that our worship and our daily walks when we leave here will be a, a powerful witness to your love and power and wisdom. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Yeah. 
Good morning. Um, as Easter draws near and we start to focus more intentionally on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we also come face to face with his suffering. And I was reading recently on earthly suffering, and I came across a quote by um, the evangelist and theologian John Stott, and here's what it reads. I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, a ghost of a smile playing round his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I have to turn away. And in imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. This is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross that symbolizes divine suffering. Now also in Philippians 1.29 it says, for you have, begin, you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Jesus came down and suffered in our broken world of shame, pain, the condemned. He mourned, he bled, he fell down, and he died. And on account of that, is our suffering taken away? No. It is that our suffering no longer gazes downward to destruction, hopelessness, and despair. In Christ's suffering, our suf in Christ's sacrifice, our suffering points now upward to the wonder of a God who would not leave us, to the broken chains. And now that we belong to him, the pain of glory not yet fully fulfilled, which we are privileged to share with him. Please join me in thanking him. God, we are just so grateful that we can come to you today, a God that would not leave us alone in our suffering, a God who joined in our suffering, who chose a body that would break and feel pain. God, we know it did not have to be this way, and we thank you that it is. We thank you for the body that we are about to remember, and, um, and thank you for your sacrifice. Let's pray one more time for the cup. Father, your blood was shed for us in a way that you did not have to do it. And we are just so grateful to sit before you today and remember that. God, let us honor it. Let us honor each other and you in the way that we take that. In your name we pray.
At this time, kids are dismissed to worship down under. And we are going to sing the following. Just a closer walk with thee. Welcome to the Laurel Church of Christ. Hopefully uh, this will be a good hour for you to spend to start your week, that you'll be blessed by the things you hear about, uh, by the prayers, by the, the singing, that this will just be a good experience for you. We hope you'll come back. If you are coming back next Sunday, the Knoxville Marathon will be taking place. And so uh, the way I sort of get it, the best way to get to the church building is you won't be able to get here from the east on Kingston Pike. You'll have to get here from the west, get out at Alcoa Highway on the interstate, or I wouldn't listen to my GPS. I would try to figure this one out on my own, but we, we might be uh, influenced a little bit by the marathon taking place. 
the offering basket's going to be passed around. We have a few more announcements to make, and uh, then we'll have a prayer. But um, in connection with the Knoxville Marathon, it's been a tradition that the Laurel Church, uh, we team up with some of the folks at Hardin Valley, I believe, and we provide a water station uh, down on Cherokee Boulevard. So the, the runners probably run about four or five miles by that time. When they get there, they, are, they need some encouragement. And so uh, we have a water station that is set up. Um, get with JT, I believe Mike Farah will be a part of that too. And um, get with them today. They need to know what volunteers we're going to have from our church who will be a part of that. Uh, there's going to be a bridal shower today uh, honoring Mary Beth Nails and Joe Hall. That's going to be in the Laurel Room today at 4 o'clock. From what I understand, guys, it's sort of a disappointment for, for you, but you are not invited to this particular shower. It is just for our ladies. So anyway, get over it, guys, and maybe next time you'll be invited. Uh, family Fun Day. Are you making an announcement about that today? No, okay. Is Tim making an announcement about that today? But anyway, there's some brochures out there about Family Fun Day. <clears throat> it's going to be this Saturday. Games for the kids. Crafts for all ages. Easter egg hunts will be going on. Uh, we came last year, uh, and it's just a really good, good day. So uh, make sure you pick up some information on that. It's also in your family news today. Okay, at this time, we want to give a, a gift from the Laurel family to Linda Tuxbury. Uh, Linda is one of our deaf members here at the church, and she was baptized uh, on March the 5th. And so uh, we have a prayer journal that we want to uh, give to Linda today. And uh, um, so I'm just going to walk over there and give that to her. We had a couple of uh, special prayer requests that came in to the, for our church this week. Uh, one is from the Causey family. Lynn uh, uh, sent this in. Uh, his daughter, Abby, is having some surgery on Tuesday, and we want to keep her in our prayers uh, uh, this week. We also had a prayer uh, request from Jim D., and Jim uh, sent a, uh, some words that he wanted to express to the Laurel Church, so I just want to read uh, read this from, from Jim. So this is Jim D. I was discharged from the UT hospital on Thursday afternoon after being hospitalized for two and a half weeks with COVID. Thank you for the cards, the visits, and especially your prayers. They have not been able to completely assess what impact, if any, the COVID infection had on my process of fighting leukemia. I know with the power of your prayers, I will succeed. Your brother, Jim D. So we want to pray for Jim right now. And um, uh, after the prayer, uh, Mike Farah is going to come up and give us a update on the elder selection process. So let's go to, to our Father in prayer. Lord, this morning we uh, lift our prayers to you. We ask for your healing hand to be on Jim D., our brother. Lord, we also ask for your prayers to be poured out for our prayers and your blessings to be poured on to Chris Hatchell as he goes through his medical treatments. Lord, there's several others, many others at this church that are going through some difficult situations. We pray for them this morning. We also pray for Abby and that her surgery will be successful um, on Tuesday. Lord, also we're mindful of the catastrophic uh, tornado events that took place in Mississippi and all the lives that were affected by that. We pray for those people who are hurting, grieving for loss of family members. We pray for those who are on their way to Mississippi to provide help 
and uh, just be with everyone involved that are trying to help what took place uh, earlier this week. Lord, this morning we're praying for Jason uh, as he gives us the lesson this morning. We're thankful for Jason and Megan and Maggie, just for that family and all they mean to us here at the church. We're thankful for the kingdom building that's taking place at the Christian Student Center as it reaches out to uh, students on the university campus. Lord, we all have a list of people that we've either written down or that's in our hearts of people that we love and people that we know that we want them to belong to you. And this morning we lift all the names of those people that are, rep that are from this congregation and the names that people are thinking about this morning and we lift those names up to you, Lord. Lord, help us to keep first things first, to get our priorities in order, to focus on you. We're grateful for the, uh, the offerings that will be made this week, that were made this morning. We pray that you'll continue to bless uh, the Laurel Church. Uh, Lord, we also uh, ask for your peace to be upon each person here represented for the kids who are downstairs and their teachers, that your powerful peace, that is the great enemy of fear and anxiety. Lord, we long for that peace. We long for that relationship with you. And Lord, give us courage to follow you no matter what our situation is, no matter where we find ourselves. Help us to be a spark. Help us to be a flame. Help us to be whatever you need us to be as we try to further your kingdom. Lord, again, thank you for every person here, all the families that are represented. represented. We're thankful for Jesus. Help us to keep remembering him all this week and uh, to be able to follow in his footsteps. We pray in his name. Amen. Good morning. So our... Elder selection process continues. Uh, we started in the winter time, and we've now come to the point where, uh, through much prayer, we, we do have candidates to announce to you today. So today I'd like to announce that uh, Wes Milam and Ed Smith, or Eddie Smith, sorry, uh, have, have agreed to go forward as new elders uh, at, for Laurel. So part of our process is that for each one of these, these candidates that, that wants, uh, has a desire to move forward uh, and become an elder, we have a questionnaire for them and we ask them to fill it out. So they've been working on this and praying about this for the last two weeks. We have copies of those uh, questionnaires filled out in the lobby. You'll find them on the little uh, tables outside uh, uh, where we normally have the bulletins. So please, one per family, because we have a limited number of these, but please one per family per candidate. Pick those up, read those, uh, pray uh, over, over this decision, uh, their decision, uh, pray about your, your uh, decision whether to affirm uh, these candidates, candidates or not. And uh, uh, next week we will have uh, affirmation and reaffirmation forms out in the uh, in the lobby for everyone to pick up and fill out. Um, speaking of reaffirmation, uh, we've also talked to the elders uh, that we currently have, and of of the elders uh, that are currently serving: uh, Joe Dernan, Gary Guyette, Anthony Fuller, Larry Ray, Bill Troxler, and John Waters have all agreed to continue serving as elders. So on our affirmation, reaffirmation form, there will be uh, a place for you to affirm each one of these, these men. Um, please take, take the questionnaire and, and prayerfully consider uh, your answers for next week. Thank you. Good morning, church. 
Uh, about a month and a half ago, I stood up here and I um, made a plea to you guys to help support and prayer for our uh, the CSC Spring Break mission trip. And we got back just a week ago from yesterday, and we had a very successful trip. We uh, completed three work projects right there on the property at the City of Children in Ensenada, Mexico. We um, did three days of food relief to church members in the town, and we also ran a VBS for all the kids there. But more importantly, we deepened or formed relationships with the kids and the staff there. And so um, uh, as a, I, I put together this very short, quick slideshow so you guys could see what you helped accomplish down at the City of Children. Um, if you are watching the live stream, we're not able to show it on the live stream because of um, laws and regulations of the orphanage down there, but um, so sorry about that. I don't know what to, what to say about that, but uh, watch this slideshow um, of, of, this, of our trip. So the City of Children is a very special place, and I am thankful for you guys, the congregation, for helping support um, us going down there and, and serving down there uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, right after I graduated from college, I was working for a church outside of Atlanta, and one of my coworkers, she, uh, one Saturday night, got a call that no one should ever get. Uh, she, her husband worked night shifts, and um, she got a call that her husband uh, got into a motorcycle accident on the way home from work and passed on the side of the road. And uh, the days leading up to the funeral, uh, it came out that um, shortly before his passing, he had written this blog post with letters to his wife and to his kids in case of his passing. And in, these, in this post and these letters, he wrote his wishes and his desires for them. And he wrote about the wisdom that he wished to impart to them. And while he didn't know that the Lord was going to call him home, so soon after he wrote these words, you could tell that he had put his heart and soul into these letters. And I'm sure that these letters became like gold to his family members that have gone back and read them multiple times 
since that tragic night. And it's that same sense and that same feeling that we get from this letter from Paul to Timothy. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be studying 2 Timothy uh, for the next couple of weeks today and next week. And so starting in verse um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter in 67 A.D., and historians get that because Paul was persecuted and martyred right before Nero's death. And Nero, he, was, uh, he died in the summer of 68 AD. And we learn later on in this letter that it was before winter. And so that would put this letter sometime in probably the third quarter of 67 AD. And this was Paul's final letter before his death. And even though uh, Tim, or Titus comes after 2 Timothy in your Bibles, right, this is his final letter. And the reason for that is because our Christian forefathers, when they were assembling the canon of Scripture, right, they didn't uh, arrange the letters by, chronologically by when they were written, but rather by length. And so that is why 2 Timothy was Paul's final letter, even though Titus comes after it. But Paul knew that his death was imminent in this letter. And you can sense that personal nature and that feel um, from Paul in this letter. And you can tell that he desperately wants to impart wisdom to the one person that he probably loves the most, and that is who we find in verse 2, his beloved son, Timothy. And Timothy wasn't his actual son, biological son, but Paul had become almost a spiritual mentor or father to Timothy. They had known each other for probably 15 years or so at this point. They had been on missionary journeys together, and it was Paul who helped to appoint Timothy to become the leader of the church in Ephesus. Continuing on in verse 3, it says, I thank God whom I serve as I did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Remember that Paul is in prison and yet he is thankful. And it says here that uh, he is constantly in prayer for Timothy. That might be because he's in prison and he has nothing better to do, right? But nonetheless, he is in constant prayer night and day for Timothy. Which brings up the question, who do you need to be in constant and consistent prayer for? I just finished reading Tyler Stanton's book, um, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. And it's a fantastic book, and I recommend it to everyone in here. But in one of the chapters of this book, Tyler, he, he goes on and he recounts this story of um, D.L. Moody, a famous theologian. If you don't know who D.L. Moody is, he was kind of the Billy Graham of the 19th century. He was the most famous theologian and evangelist of his time. In D.L. Moody, he carried around this list of 100 names of friends that did not know Jesus. And he carried around this list with him every single day, and every day he prayed for the names on this list. And at the time of D.L. Moody's death, 96 of the names had been crossed off because they had started a relationship with Jesus. And if that isn't inspiring enough, what's even more inspiring is that the story doesn't end there. 
You see, the other four names that were on that list, they showed up to D.L. Moody's funeral. And we're so inspired by the stories of his faith and his relationship with Jesus that he had that they wanted that for themselves. And all four of those names started a relationship with Jesus at D.L. Moody's funeral. Prayer works. Constant and consistent Prayer works. It may not work in the timeline we have or the way that we want it to work, but prayer works. And Paul understood that when he was in constant and consistent prayer for Timothy. And so who do you need to be in constant and consistent prayer over? Continuing on in verse 4, it says, As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Unica, and, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Growing up, one of the houses that we lived in, um, it was a two-story house and all of the bedrooms were upstairs and all of the living spaces were downstairs and uh, I remember this house because when you came in the front door you you came onto the landing area not much bigger than the stage or probably smaller than the stage um, and you came into the landing area and you could either go up half a flight of stairs to the bedrooms or down half a flight of stairs to the living areas and even though I was younger, I remember this house well, and I remember that landing well, because that landing became a sacred space for me. You see, most mornings, when we were waiting for the school bus to come and pick us up, my mother would sit us down on that landing, and she would pray over us or give us a quick devotional thought, or have us join her in songs of praise to our God. You see, that landing became a sacred space for me because it's where I got to witness the real and sincere faith of my mom. You see, I was fortunate enough to have parents that showed me their real and sincere faith, and that certainly helped me develop my own faith. And I think if you're sitting here this morning and you are a parent, I think one of your most important calls as a parent, as a Christian parent, is to show your children that real and sincere faith. You see, it's not good enough to just tell them you have faith or to just show up at church, right? You have to actually show them that real and sincere faith. Kids are smart. They can pick up on things. They know if your faith is just a lip service faith or if it's real and sincere. It is estimated that two-thirds or more of kids who grew up in the church end up walking away from their faith when they leave the house. Two-thirds or more. And one of the, the attributing factors for kids that remain faithful and stay in the faith is that they say that they got to witness a real and sincere faith of their parents or their caregivers. And that they wanted that faith for themselves. And so if you're here this morning and you're a parent, show your kids that real and sincere faith. And I'm not saying that if you show them that real and sincere faith that they will automatically develop a faith of their own. 
Faith isn't inherited. That's not the way faith works. In fact, I know many people who I look up to that have uh, great faith, that have many prodigal sons and daughters who they are hoping and praying will come back and either start or renew a relationship with Christ. I'm not saying that by showing that real and sincere faith to your kids that they will automatically have a faith of their own, but what I am saying is that by showing it, it will certainly benefit them. It benefited Timothy with his grandmother and his mother. And it certainly benefited me with my parents. And I'm positive it will benefit you and your kids and my kid as well. And now we get to kind of what I, I like to call the thesis statement of this letter in verse, uh, starting in verse 6. And this is kind of where we're going to uh, stay for the rest of the time this morning. Uh, verse 6, it says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Paul is almost uh, certainly referring to uh, the time that they appointed Timothy as the leader of the church in Ephesus. We, we discover in Paul's first letter to Timothy that the elders laid their hand on Timothy when he was appointed the leader, and Paul was almost certainly there and laid his hands on him as well. We also discover from Paul's first letter to Timothy that Timothy struggled with giving into the spirit of fear. In his first letter, Paul said that uh, Timothy was, um, was concerned that people were looking down on him because he was young. And Timothy apparently really, really struggled with this idea of giving in to the spirit of fear. And the thing is, is that Timothy isn't so different from you and me. If I were to be completely honest with you, this is something that I struggle with on a weekly, almost daily basis. I struggle with imposter syndrome, thinking that I'm not good enough, that I'm not spiritual enough, that I sin too much. I think that I'm not talented enough, or I'm not a good enough leader, or I'm not wise enough, or I'm not a good enough speaker. I think that I'm not a good enough husband or a father. I think that I'm too short, right? And sometimes I feel I'm too Asian to be effective for ministry. And the truth is, say I bet everyone in here, or most everyone in here, has felt similar thoughts, or do feel similar thoughts in their own lives as well. That you don't have the spiritual gifts to be useful to God. That you're not spiritual enough or you sin too much, or you're not good enough, or you're not rich enough, or you don't know the right people. See, we all have fears and weaknesses that prevent us from participating in kingdom work that God desires for us. We all have fears and weaknesses that prevent us from participating in kingdom work that God desires for us. When I was working for that same church in Atlanta, there is a period of probably like a week or a month where I felt this tug and this calling from the Holy Spirit. And it, this is going to sound a little strange, but I felt this tug and call to pick up everything and moved to Las Vegas and joined God in his kingdom work there. 
And I used all these excuses. I was right out of college, and so I, like Timothy, I used the excuse that I was too young, that I didn't have enough experience, that I didn't know anything about planting a church. I was broke. I was right out of college and working for a church, right? I, I had no money. I used that excuse as well. I used the excuse that I didn't know anyone in Las Vegas. I think at that point I had never even been there. And I used all these excuses that prevented me from joining God and His kingdom work in Las Vegas. And while I'm thankful for the work that God has called me to now, sometimes I still wonder if instead of college students, I'd be ministering to crack addicts. Instead of Tennessee fans, Texas Hold'em players. And instead of ministering to sororities and fraternities, ministering to strippers and prostitutes. You see, we all have fears and weaknesses that prevent us from participating in kingdom work that God desires for us. Corey Ten Boone, the, the famous Holocaust survivor who uh, forgave her guards that, that beat her and imprisoned her, she has this quote about worry and fear, and it says, worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. And that is so true, isn't it? But the thing is, is that we shouldn't let worry and fear and our weaknesses be a source of our fear, right? You see, God has uh, a history of using weaknesses for His glory. Our weaknesses, His power is perfected in our weakness. You see, uh, Abraham and Sarah, they were 190 years old when they had their promised child, Isaac, way past the age of childbearing. Moses, he had a speech impediment, and yet he was called upon by God to uh, stand up to Pharaoh and Egypt and lead his people out of slavery. David was the least, even in his own family, and yet he defeated the Philistines and their warrior, Goliath. Peter denied Christ to avoid persecution. And yet he became the cornerstone of the church. Christ, his body hanging on the cross, bloodied and broken and dead, defeated sin and death. Paul, he persecuted Christians who followed the resurrected Jesus. He persecuted them, and yet he became the greatest church planter and evangelist the world has ever seen. And we read here, even Timothy fears because of his age and how young he was and all of his weaknesses, was the leader of one of the most influential churches of the time in Ephesus. And we read in these verses that that is what God, how God used Timothy even with a spark, not even a full-on flame. Imagine how God could have used a full flame in Timothy. The thing is, is that often we settle for a spark of the Holy Spirit when God desires for us to have access to the full power of a flame. We often settle And we shouldn't settle for a spark when we have access 
to the full power of a flame. You see, a spark is like settling for a bite or a slice of the pie when God, he wants to give you the whole thing. A spark is like settling for and being content with being in the stands or riding the bench when God wants you to be the star player. A spark. A spark is like accepting Christ's forgiveness of your sin, but a flame, a flame is being able to conquer that sin in your life today. A spark is, is wanting an easy life from God, but a flame, that is wanting a fulfilling life from God and having a fulfilling life from God. A spark is being able to uh, uh, get along with your enemies, right? But a flame, that is, is being able to love them. A spark is having, is coexisting with a spouse or a family member. But a flame is having a loving, meaningful marriage or relationship with them. A spark is merely wanting to witness God and his kingdom work, but a flame is being a participant in it. A spark is like, it's like being Facebook acquaintances with Jesus or social media friends with Jesus. But a flame is getting to meet him in real life and becoming best friends and moving into a really small apartment together and having him become your Lord and Savior. You see, way too often we settle for a spark when God desires for us to have access to the full power of a flame. And so what does this mean for us this morning? What can we do this week to help us not settle for a spark and instead live as if we have a flame? Well, three things to identify. And the first is to identify and pray for someone every day this week. Identify someone that you want to pray for every day this week that needs your prayers. And set an alarm in your calendar or an alarm on your phone. And when that notification or alarm goes off, don't just swipe it away. Actually take time and pray for them every single day this week. And I'm not just talking about one of those, you know, Oh, I pray for Megan, right, when it goes off. Like, actually, stop what you're doing and pray for them. The second is to identify fears and weaknesses. Identify some of your fears and some of your weaknesses that are preventing you from doing kingdom work, whether that's uh, sharing with a coworker or joining in with God in a certain ministry or serving here at this church or at the CSC, right? Identify your fears and weaknesses and do more than just that, more than just identify it. But I want you to think about how God could use those weaknesses to show his great power. And last but not least, identify reservations that prevent you from following Christ. If you are here this morning and you are not yet a follower of Jesus and he is not yet your Lord and Savior, identify your questions and your reservations and your fears that you have about following him. And I want you to lean into those questions and those reservations And know that I have been praying for you. And I'm confident that as you lean into those reservations and explore those questions, that God will draw you near to himself. And 
And so, if you are here this morning and you haven't made that commitment to Christ and to have Him as your Lord and Savior, and you want access to the Holy Spirit, this flame that we are talking about, there's nothing more than I would love to do than tell you how to make that happen. As we wrap up today's service and, and we sing this next song, there are going to be some elders and myself in the back. They're there to meet any spiritual needs that you may have. Thank you. Will you please stand? He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort brought. Why have I to wear? comforting and soothing songs I know to start a new week with. There is a bomb. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the world Sometimes I feel discouraged and 
morning, church. Everybody doing good? So I got to plug the worship renewal team. Uh, we've been at work for the past month or two, uh, developing some stuff, and really want your feedback. We got about a week left, so I asked the lead a closing prayer so I can plug this. So it's in your bulletin. It's out front. If you want to get with anybody else, just uh, we are here to hear your voice. Um, Knoxville is absolutely beautiful throughout the year. Um, Christ has done wonders for allowing us to meet on Sundays to see this rejuvenation that we get to go into the week. In Knoxville being a five or six season city, we get to see this rejuvenation a couple of times this spring. So I'm very thankful for that and I get to spend this time with you guys each Sunday morning, which is meaningful. And over the past couple of weeks, I've gotten to know a lot of you through this uh, worship renewal uh, uh, coordination, and it never gets uncomfortable standing up here in front of the large group. So weaknesses, right? We all have them. This is one of mine, but uh, if I can do kingdom work by getting up here and showing that it can be done, that's... Uh, Amen. Thank you, God. Uh, would you pray with me? Father, I'd like to thank you for this time we are given to spend worshiping you. Each Sunday reminds us of the gift of Jesus that you have given to each one of us. And it is, it is our duty to go out into this world now and be a reflection of that gift and promise of eternal life with you. I ask that you go out into this world before us now and set our path. Allow us to see what it is you would have us do. I ask that while we seek you, that you protect us, protect us from this world. Take those worries and our weaknesses and use them for your glory. And finally, give your people peace and hope in times of trials. I ask through Jesus all of this. Amen. Amen.